Hello, welcome back. I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. So uh, just before the Thanksgiving break, uh, we were talking about the time dependence of nuclear decay. And we observed that in nuclear decay, the number of decaying nuclei is uh, in a given time period delta t is proportional to the uh, nuclei that is available, which sort of makes sense, and proportional to the time delta t. And the proportionality constant we call the decay constant, uh, lambda. So the change in the number of uh, nuclei that survive is minus lambda times uh, the number itself times delta t. Or time derivative of the number is uh, proportional to the number itself. That is the uh, defining equation of an exponential function. So the number of nuclei as a function of t is the uh, number of nuclei at time equals zero times an exponential function with the decay constant in the argument. Then the activity or the decay rate is the time derivative of this function, which is just minus lambda times this function. And if we discard the minus sign, then uh, we just get lambda times n naught times e to the minus lambda t. And we call this lambda n naught uh, or not the uh, activity at time equals zero. And the unit for activity is per second, disintegrations per second, or uh, Becquerel. And we define the half-life, uh, T1 half, as that time where the number of nuclei uh, uh, that is left at that time is one half the original number of nuclei. And by the, because the uh, activity is proportional to the number of nuclei, that means that the activity at the half-life is the, uh, the original activity divided by two as well. There's also another time uh, we can define, which is the, uh, the mean lifetime. And that uh, relates to the half-life time, T1 half. So if we take the uh, logarithm to basis E, of n of t1 half divided by n naught, then uh, by definition, this is just 1 half. So this is the natural logarithm of 1 half. And that has to be the uh, natural logarithm of e to the minus lambda t1 half. And uh, e to the power and natural logarithm cancel. So we know that uh, log e of 1 half has to be minus lambda times t1 half. And that means that t1 half is uh, minus the logarithm of uh, 1 half over lambda, or plus the logarithm of 2 over lambda. And the natural logarithm of 2 is 0 0.693. And so from now on, we will be using 0 0.693. So t1 half is 0 0.693 over lambda. The mean life, however, is just 1 over lambda. So that means that t1 half is 0 0.693 times the mean lifetime. If the uh, half-life is short, that means that the activity is, more, uh, is higher, and therefore it is more uh, dangerous uh, than, uh, than the longer half-life. However, on the other hand, the short half-life means that if you, uh, uh, you can usually wait it out, and it reduces faster to a safe level. So uh, as a rule of thumb, you should wait for about 10 half-lives uh, for activity to, uh, to become safe. But that's just a rule of thumb because, of course, it depends on the original activity. If we compute with uh, the exponential law uh, this rule of thumb, then uh, after 10 half-lives, the uh, activity is 2 to the power of minus 10 of the original activity. And that is uh, roughly 0.1%. As an example, let's look at carbon-14, which has a half-life of 5,730 years. So it's hard to wait it out. Uh, if a sample contains 10 to the 22 carbon-14 nuclei, what is the activity? So the answer is, uh, is easy. We take uh, uh, the activity as the uh, decay constant times the, uh, the original number of nuclei, or the original number of nuclei divided by the mean life. 
And since the uh, half-life is 0.693 uh, times the mean life, that means that the activity is 0.693 and not divided by the half-life. We are given a not 10 to the 22, and we just have to express the half-life in seconds. So it's 5,730 years times the number of days in an, in an average year times the number of hours in a day times the number of seconds in an hour. And uh, that gives us an activity of 3.83 times 10 to the 10 Becquerel. It's a fairly large activity. So let's assume that uh, in a laboratory we have 1.49 micrograms of pure nitrogen-13 and that has a half-life of 10 minutes or 600 seconds. So the question is how many nuclei are present initially? What is the initial activity? What is the activity after one hour? And after approximately how long will the activity drop to less than one becquerel? So we use uh, as the atomic weight of, uh, of nitrogen 13, just 13 units. And uh, so that means it's 13 grams per mole. And we can therefore calculate the number of moles from the number of grams. So it's 1.49 uh, times 10 to the minus 6 grams divided by 13 gram per mole. And that means we have 1.15 times 10 to the minus 7 uh, mole. To express it in number of particles, we multiply this with Avogadro's number. So uh, times 6 uh, times 10 to the 23rd, and that gives us 6.9 times 10 to the 16 nuclei uh, uh, that we have initially. Now we can calculate the initial activity just like we did with carbon uh, 14, simply 0.693 times this number divided by the half-life, which in this case is 600 seconds. And that gives us 7.97 times 10 to the 13 uh, Becquerel. So at some later time t, uh, we know that the activity uh, follows an exponential law. So it's r naught times e to the minus lambda t. And lambda is uh, 0 0.693 divided by t one half. And we can plug in the numbers for the initial uh, activity r naught which is the 7.97 times 10 to the 13 Becquerel times e to the minus uh, 0.693. This factor is for the number of, we are asked to, uh, the activity after one hour, so this is the number of seconds in an hour. This one is the half-life. And if we plug in the numbers, we get uh, 1.25 times 10 to the 12 Becquerel. And finally, for the last question, how long will it take to get down to one becquerel? We have the requirement that the activity at time t should be one becquerel. And so that means that this exponential factor has to be one over the initial activity to cancel out the initial activity. And so we take the logarithm of this equation. So that cancels the exponential. I just have this ratio. And the logarithm of this is minus 32.236. And if I solve for the time, I get 27,900 seconds, or 7.75 hours. So that's how long it takes to uh, reach activities of one background. Uh, <clears throat> last, last week, we briefly uh, discussed uh, radiocarbon dating. So uh, we can date organic material uh, because uh, organisms absorb carbon-14 out of the air. Carbon-14 is produced in a steady state by neutrons that are made by cosmic rays, charge exchanging with uh, the nitrogen-14. Charge exchange means the neutron gets absorbed in the nucleus and the proton gets ejected out of the nucleus at the same time. So while the organism lives, they absorb it either by uh, photosynthesis, for plants or uh, by food, for any, anything else. So that we have about uh, 1.3 times 10 to the minus 12 of the carbon nuclei in an organism is uh, actually carbon-14. So that means that at the time of death of the organism, uh, that is the activity, which we then use as initial activity. Since no, uh, <coughs> no further carbon-14 is added, uh, that's then just a pure exponential decay. 
and we uh, measure the activity per mass to allow the reconstruction of the time of death. So uh, as a refinement of the technique, one can adjust small variations in this carbon-14 production using samples where the age is determined by other means, for example, using tree rings or such. Let's say uh, we found an, uh, uh, in an archaeological site uh, some animal bone fragment. And if the uh, mass of the carbon in that bone fragment is 200 grams, and that sample registers an activity of 16 becquerel, uh, what is the age? So uh, first, we, uh, we determine the number of carbon nuclei. So again, we use Avogadro's number and the mass and the average um, mass per carbon. In this case, we just ignore the, uh, the uh, small ratio of carbon-14. So we have a total number of carbon nuclei of about 10 to the 25, if you plug in those numbers. So that means that at the, uh, at the time of death, we had 1.3 times 10 to the 13 carbon-14 nuclei using that uh, constant ratio. Now we use the exponential decay law. So at our present time, uh, the number of uh, nuclei is the uh, activity divided by the decay constant, or the activity times the half-life divided by 0.693. So the activity is 16 becquerel, and uh, this is the half-life in years, and now we adjust to get it into seconds. And that means that now we have 4.2 times 10 to the 12 uh, carbon-14 nuclei. So initially we had 1.3 times 10 to the 13, of those only 4.2 times 10 to the 12 survived. And we can now take the ratio of those two numbers and take the logarithm, then this will give us the factor within the exponential function, which is 0.693 times the time divided by uh, the half-life. And uh, if we calculate this logarithm of this ratio, 4.2 over, uh, over 13, then it is minus 1.14. And uh, solving for the time, this gives us 9,400 uh, years. So that is uh, the approximate age of this uh, bone fragment. One uh, doesn't have to, uh, to use carbon-14 for uh, radioactivity-based dating. Uh, in fact, you can only go back to about 60,000 years uh, with uh, carbon-14 because eventually all of it will have decayed and you can't measure any activity anymore. So if you want to date rocks, for example, uh, you have to uh, use something that has longer half-life, so, uh, so different isotopes. For example, uh, uranium-238 is useful with a half-life of 4.5 times 10 to the 9 years. And with using uranium-238, one can date the oldest rocks on Earth uh, to a, an age of about 4 times 10 to the 9 years. There are actually uh, decay chains of uh, uh, uranium and, uh, and thorium, for example, meaning that you start with, say, uranium-238, and it alpha decays to uranium-234, then uh, it beta decays here, it beta decays back to uranium, then more alpha decays, alpha decay, alpha decay, alpha decay, then either more alpha decays or it beta decays. This is the, uh, the nuclear charge, this one is the mass. And then you can proceed to further alpha and beta decays until you finally get uh, to stable nuclei. So there are several such uh, de uh, decay families. So let's look at an example. In the decay chain of uranium-238, there are four successive nucleides with half-lives of uh, 250,000 years, 75,000 years, 1,600 years, and four days. So let's look back at those to find those. It's this alpha de uh, decay chain. So this one is the, uh, is the very long one and gets shorter. This one is only 1,600 years and this one is only four days. And the question is, given that we have those uh, largely uh, different half-lives, which activity is, uh, is the highest if it all started from pure uranium-238 a million years ago? 
then naively one would expect that uh, since the activity is proportional to the half-life, uh, uh, to the inverse half-life, that, uh, that the one with the four days has the highest activities. However, it turns out that all four activities are, uh, are about the same. And by the way, one can distinguish the activity of each one by looking at the different energies of the alpha particles. And the reason is that the decay of the parent acts as a bottleneck. So we don't have simple exponential decays anymore. But uh, we can approximate in this case because the decay times differ by so much. So we can say, for example, uh, that the half-life of 1,600 years uh, is so much longer than the half-life of four days that as soon as the parent is produced, it, uh, it already decays, but of course it can't decay before it's made, and therefore the activity is determined by the longest of those four half-lives, and it's the same for all four. So let's move to uh, detection of radiation. So the original method of detection, for example in Rutherford's time, was to find a student and make him watch a phosphorescent screen in, in total darkness after his eyes have ad adapted to darkness. Rutherford's student, uh, which was a guy named Geiger, uh, he was fed up with that and so he developed the Geiger counter, an electric way of, uh, of recording uh, activities. And a Geiger counter is a high voltage device, so we have a, a cylinder which is connected to the negative end of a high voltage on the outside, and there's a wire in the center which is uh, connected to the positive end. And if there's an ionizing particle passing through between the wire and the, uh, the negative casing, then it ionizes uh, the gas that is left in this tube. And then there are, uh, the ionization releases electrons which then uh, drift to the negative end. And if the voltage is large enough, uh, then they acquire enough energy to knock out uh, other electrons, i.e. ionize even further, and you get an avalanche. And this avalanche of electrons, when it reaches the central wire, it, uh, it causes the voltage to briefly drop. And one can uh, then uh, electronically watch for uh, such a voltage drop and record that as one count, or one particle passing through. Alternatively, if one wants to detect photons, there is a similar device where we have a photocathode, so we use the photoelectric effect. So uh, if you have an incoming photon in the photocathode, it releases a photoelectron, and then we have this successive dynodes, as they are called. Uh, those are metal plates uh, it's, uh, which are successively higher in voltage. And so the photoelectron drifts to the first dynode, and when it reaches it, it has acquired enough energy to, uh, to knock out uh, more electrons out of that metal plate. And so uh, we get more that reach the second dynode, which is at an even higher voltage. And then each, each one of those secondary electrons makes a tertiary one. And so you get even more, and you go from dynode to dynode, each time uh, multiplying the number of electrons. And when you're finally going to the anode, uh, you have a, a, a large avalanche of electrons which uh, register as a voltage drop. And that's called a photomultiplier tube, and they're sensitive to uh, individual uh, photons. And both uh, Geiger counters and photomultiplier tubes are still in use today. So uh, one can use uh, photomultiplier tubes uh, in, a, in conjunction with a material, uh, uh, for example, a scintillation crystal, which, and the only requirement for the material is that it emits light if a charged particle passes through. So that can be a solid, like a scintillation crystal, but there's also a liquid uh, scintillator, or one can even use a, a scintillating gas. Nowadays, in addition to those high voltage devices, uh, we, uh, we have semiconductor detectors. And those are basically diodes which you operate in, uh, uh, reversely. And uh, the leakage current that goes through the diode in the wrong direction is actually going to be bigger once you have ionizing particles passing through. 
And then, of course, the oldest technique of uh, detecting radioactivity, uh, one can uh, use photographic emulsion, thereby even record the track of the particle. So that brings us to tracking detectors. Uh, there are also uh, so-called bubble and cloud chambers. And uh, the way they work is uh, like the contrail of, uh, of an airplane. If you have a path of, uh, of a uh, charged particle, it leaves in its wake uh, ions because it's, an I uh, it's ionizing radiation. And those uh, are acting as seeds to grow, uh, for example, bubbles or droplets, which then can be made visible later. And so this pretty much works the same way as an airplane uh, uh, streaming through the sky, uh, making uh, uh, clouds behind them. Also, another possibility is to make a very, very complex Geiger counter. And those are called drift or time projection chambers with uh, using many, many, many different wires. For example, this is the, uh, the drift chamber of the so-called CDF detector at Fermilab that was uh, in use for many years. And uh, one uses not just the fact that uh, there is a signal and on which wire there is the signal, but one uses the uh, time it takes the ions or the, uh, the electrons to drift to that wire to uh, reconstruct uh, tracks in three dimensions. And then one can use the semiconductor detectors uh, as trackers also by uh, uh, having a, a more complex diode structure. Let me summarize uh, nuclear physics. Uh, nuclear physics studies atomic nuclei, and those nuclei are made out of nucleons, which in term, turn are made out of quarks, and protons have a charge of plus the elementary charge, and neutrons have no charge. A nuclide X is characterized by the number of protons and the charge number Z, which is the number of protons, as well as the number of nucleons, or the mass number A. And so one symbolically writes uh, X as uh, AZX. So uh, A is uh, usually not just exactly the number of, uh, of nucleons, but it is given in uh, unified atomic mass units. So one U is one gram per mole, or 931.5 MeV per C square, or 1.66 times 10 to the minus 7 kilograms. Uh, the nucleus is held together by, uh, by uh, the nuclear force, which is a residual effect of the quark color charge uh, of the strong interaction. The mass of a nucleus is less than the sum of the constituent masses. The difference is the uh, total binding energy, and the binding energy per nucleon is roughly 8 MeV. The value for the nucleus is a measure of the stability of the nucleus. The nuclear force has a short range, uh, a few femtometers only, and the nuclear radius is proportional to the mass uh, number to the one-third power. The unstable nuclei undergo radioactive decay. They change into other nuclei and emit particles in the process. Alpha decay emits uh, a helium nucleus, and it is mediated by the strong interaction. And those uh, alpha particles, they, uh, they tunnel through the Coulomb barrier uh, due to the peculiarities of quantum mechanics. Then a beta decays emit either uh, positrons or electrons and a neutrino or antineutrino, and they are, they are governed by uh, the so-called weak interaction. Uh, gamma decay emits gamma rays, which are photons, uh, to de-excite an excited nucleus. Uh, the nucleus itself is not changed, and it's governed by the electromagnetic interaction. The transformation of parent to daughter nucleus is called transmutation. Decays conserve energy, linear and angular momentum, electric charge, baryon number, and lepton number. And uh, the number of decaying nuclei delta n in time delta t uh, is proportional to n and delta t, which leads to an exponential decay law. Uh, the rate is defined as the time derivative of the nuclei as a function of time, and that also has an uh, exponential decay law. 
Uh, finally, the half-life is the time that's required for half of the nuclei of a sample to decay or for the activity to decay to uh, one half of your original activity. Uh, the half-life is related to the uh, uh, mean life by uh, the factor 0.693 or the natural logarithm of 2. Uh, radioactive decay is used for dating, uh, so uh, for example with carbon-14 or uranium-238. And uh, there are multiple detectors for radiation, uh, Geiger counters, photomultiplier tubes, scintillation counters, uh, semiconductor detectors, and photographic emulsion. Some of those are able to track, uh, for example, cloud and bubble chambers, photographic emulsion, uh, drift and time projection chambers, as well as uh, semiconductor trackers. So uh, let's move on now uh, to uh, application of, uh, uh, of radiation, so effects and, uh, and uses of, of radiation. So uh, radiation, as it turns out, have uh, extensive medical application. Let's first talk about radiation damage. Since radiation uh, that we are talking about, alpha, beta, and gamma, uh, x-rays, in addition, uh, there's also protons, neutrons, pions, and muons, all of those are ionizing forms of radiation, meaning that uh, they have enough energy to uh, knock out electrons from, uh, from atoms and leave ions in their wake. Uh, the charged particles ionize uh, directly due to the electric forces. And the neutral particles, they ionize indirectly. Uh, for example, they can ionize via the Compton effect, if it's gamma radiation, or the photoelectric effect, or uh, pair production, or uh, nuclear interactions, or uh, uh, something else. Typical energies of more than a say an MeV, means that it can ionize many, many, many atoms since it requires only about 10 electron volts to, uh, to ionize uh, an atom. So uh, once you have all those ions, uh, there's, uh, dam there can be damage to the material, uh, but in particular the uh, uh, damage is important in the case of uh, biological tissue. So uh, in biological tissue, ionization in cells produce uh, radicals, uh, which are chemically very active and interfere with the regular cell operations. The radiation, for example, can destroy chemical bonds by knocking out those electrons and uh, alter the mo uh, molecule structure. Now, the loss of a single protein is typically not, uh, not very serious because the cell can produce more of, uh, of the correct uh, protein. But if too many are damaged in too short a time, then they may not get reproduced in time and the uh, cell might die. Also, if there's damage to the DNA itself, that means that, uh, that all future proteins uh, will inherit that damage. And that can be fatal to the cell, or it can induce a cell to become a cancer cell in a multicellular organism. To measure uh, radiation, uh, we've already encountered uh, the unit of Becquerel, which is the number of decays per second. Uh, in the US, there's, a, there's another unit that's widely used, which is called one Curie. And the Curie is 3.7 times 10 to the 10 Becquerel. So it's, uh, those are the same thing, really. <clears throat> to, uh, to measure the uh, radiation damage, it is more useful than just looking at how many particles there are, is to study how much energy is deposited per mass. And so one gray means that one joule gets deposited per, uh, per kilogram of mass. Also, an older unit is one rad, which is 0 0.01 gray or one Röntgen, which is 1.6 times 10 to the 12 ion pairs per gram of dry air. And one Röntgen uh, means it's uh, 0 0.878 times 10 to the minus 2 joules per kilogram of dry air, or uh, 0 0.878 rad for dry air. The absorbed dose depends both on the radioactive intensity as well as the material that is subjected to it. For example, the density of the material plays a role. For uh, biological damage, even uh, uh, this additional unit, which, look, which looks at the energy deposit, is not enough to really judge the damage. 
Uh, for example, alpha particles does more damage than, uh, than other radiation since uh, the ion pairs are produced closer together. Therefore, the, uh, the, the damage tends to multiply. So one defines a quality factor, uh, simply from experience, uh, how much uh, biological damage occurs. And this quality factor is also called uh, relative biological effectiveness. And so one defines an effective dose, which is the dose times this quality factor. And uh, the unit for that is sievert. So one sievert is the quality factor times one gray. And in older units, one rem uh, is the quality factor times one rad. And rem stands for Röntgen equivalent man. So these are quality factors for radiation types. Uh, so X-rays and gamma rays have a quality factor of one. Beta rays have a quality factor of approximately one. Fast protons are also one. Slow neutrons is about three. Fast neutrons is up to a quality factor of about 10. And alpha and heavy ions can have quality factors up to 20. There's also, also natural background radioactivity. And that's about uh, 3 millisievert per year or 300 millirem per year. And legally allowed is an additional dose of about 1 millisievert uh, per year. And that is uh, due to, for example, uh, medical x-rays and, uh, and other such things. For radiation workers, uh, uh, the legal limit is somewhat higher. So uh, up to 50 millisievert per year are allowed or 5 rem per year. However, that uh, high dose should not be sustained over several years, so the average per five years should be less than 20 millisievert per year. And uh, the radiation exposure of uh, radiation workers is uh, monitored with devices such as a radiation film badge, which is a piece of film that's wrapped in light tight material, and periodically that film is developed, and uh, then the uh, total exposure is measured or a more modern devices, a thermoluminescent dosimeter. But all those devices, uh, they don't protect against radiation. They just monitor how much radiation occurred. And by the way, the 50% uh, the, uh, lethal dosage for uh, human beings is four sievert uh, in a short period of time. And uh, 10 sievert pretty much means uh, you're going to die. If you look at, uh, at natural radioactivity, I have this uh, uh, little simulation here that lets you simulate what, what happens if you expose yourself to various natural uh, radioactivity forms. For example, this is food. Food contains uh, potassium-40, which is radioactive. Or here we have various uh, uranium salts produce a nice yellow colors and they're sometimes added to glass to give a characteristic nice color. Very importantly, if you fly, flying means that you are uh, usually flying uh, with cosmic showers, which are uh, high energy cosmic ray particles, which pair produce many, many secondary uh, particles. And the maximum of that exposure is just at the altitude that planes usually pass. So if you fly a lot, then you have a lot of radiation exposure. So uh, in certain parts of the world are more radioactive than others. And it depends on, uh, on your altitude as well as uh, on uh, the quality of the soil. Then. Uh, in some areas, uh, uh, radon gas accumulates, in particular in your, in your own basement, and uh, that is uh, radioactive. And then uh, finally, uh, just the soil itself gives you some exposure. Let's look at a different example. Uh, what uh, whole body dose is received by a 70 kilogram laboratory worker that is exposed to a 40 uh, millicurie cobalt source? And we assume that the body has a 1.5 square meter cross-sectional area 
and is normally about four meters away from the uh, source for four hours every day. Cobalt-60 emits 1.33 MeV and 1.17 MeV gammas in uh, quick su succession. And about 50% of the gammas interact in the body and deposit all their energy. So we start this problem by imagining a sphere around the cobalt source with radius of four meters. And that sphere has a surface area. And if we want to know the probability of a gamma ray striking the person, then we uh, take the ratio of the uh, person's cross-sectional area uh, to the total surface area of the sphere. So we have this four meter sphere and it has a surface area of 4 pi times 4 meters square. This is 201 uh, square meters. And that means that since the cross-sectional area is 1.5 uh, square meters, and only one half of the gammas interact in the body, uh, that the probability to uh, have a uh, gamma absorbed in the body is one half times 1.5 divided by 201, or 0.373%. And that is also the fraction of the gamma energy that is, uh, is deposited. So we can calculate the power. So we have uh, the, uh, the, the factor to calculate from, uh, from uh, 40 millicurie, this is the 0 0.04, to Becquerel's, that is the 3.7 times 10 to the 10 uh, per second. So this is the activity in uh, disintegrations per second. Then if you sum the two gamma energies, uh, 1.33 and 1.17, that gives us 2.5 MeV. Then we convert uh, electron volts into joules with uh, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joule per electron volts. And then finally, uh, we, uh, uh, we have the four hours per day, so four times 3,600 seconds times uh, this, uh, if we calculate this power, it gives us 5.92 uh, times 10 to the minus four uh, joules per day. So we get 8.5 joules per day in the four hours uh, of, of exposure. So since we absorb out of, uh, that is the power of the entire source. So uh, since we only get 0.373% of that, and then we set it in relation to the 70 kilograms of the person's uh, weight. And that gives us a dosage of 4.5 times 10 to the minus 4 gray. And for gray, the quality for gamma radiation, the quality factor is 1. So we get about a 0 0.45 uh, millisievert of effective dose, which is a fairly large uh, dose. Uh, so uh, the person should probably try and reduce the amount of work uh, that close to the source. Let's calculate an example with, uh, with radon gas. Uh, radon gas actually is the second leading cause of lung cancer uh, after smoking. So it probably the death rate exceeds that from drunk driving. So it's, uh, it's a, s a somewhat serious risk. If there's more than uh, four picocurie per liter of air, the EPA recommends taking action to reduce the activity. And in some areas, 50% of the houses are actually above that limit. And uh, let's estimate the total mass of uh, radon-222 that is responsible for uh, four picocurie. So four picocurie is four times 10 to the minus 12 uh, curie. And this is the conversion to Becquerel. So we have 4 times 10 to the minus 12 times 3.7 times 10 to the 10 Becquerel, or 0 0.148 Becquerel. And we can uh, set that in relation to the number of nuclei using the factor 0.693 and the half-life, which is 3.8232 uh, per day. And that leaves us with about 70,500 nuclei. We can calculate how many moles that is by uh, dividing out Avogadro's number. So this is 1.17 times 10 to the minus 19 mole. And uh, since we know that radon has 222 uh, uh, grams per mole, we can uh, calculate the amount of grams. And it's only 2.6 times 10 to the minus 19 uh, grams. And by the way, radon activity can be reduced by uh, using uh, 
certain plastics which delay the passage of the radon gas through it for longer than uh, it takes the radon to decay, then the, uh, the radon will decay in that, uh, in that plastic. Like any beta emitter, uh, the beta radiation itself is not so harmful. It's only when you breathe in the radon gas and it's inside your lungs that it uh, causes harm. So uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>